Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Friday, August 26th installment of the Silicon Insider, the only uncensored look at life and business in the Valley. My name is Mike Malone, and I'm here with special contributor Scott Budman, technology reporter for NBC Bay Area. Our producer is Jordan Henderson. Our East Coast correspondent is Bob Grove. And our host, as always, is the Silicon Valley Business Journal. Okay, well, let's start with this is kind of this came in as kind of a curveball the last 24 hours. But the state of the state of California is looking at banning all gas powered cars in 2035. I guess the Air Quality Board is voting on it first and then it goes to the assembly. And Governor Newsom wants this. Yeah, and California, as of Thursday, passed it. So it's new car sales that by 2035 will have to be all electric. And they've set up uh, various um, you know, goals along the way, 30%, 60%. But by 2035, they say all new car sales will have to be either electric or hydrogen. They threw that in there as well. Well, I, we have a hydrogen gas station near my house, across from Fremont High School. It seems to be on and off all the time. And it just, just the thought that they have a Hindenburg underground across the street from a high school gives me pause <laughs> anyway. Uh, but there are there are hydrogen vehicles. When, when they do have hydrogen, there's hydrogen vehicles there. So I guess, uh, but this seems almost, you know, a bit hurried. I mean, we just talked a couple of weeks ago about that, uh, that piece by the woman CEO of that battery company. Uh, Power, where she was talking about how the supply chain, there's problems every step along the way to creating batteries right now, from buying lithium from, you know, third world dictators to all the way through to, we don't know how to recycle these things in volume. So, you know, if we start filling every car in California with batteries, we're going to have a lot of landfill. Because right now, it's basically just small little outfits doing you know, contract work, recycling. So can we build that entire supply chain and make it affordable all in the next 13 years? I mean, there are a few things we have to do. Obviously, we've got to improve battery technology and performance, and we have to get chargers out there. We have to figure out what to do if you're in an apartment situation and maybe don't have chargers nearby. All these new buildings, uh, you know, have to come with chargers. We have to figure out a way to power them more efficiently a la solar instead of gas. Uh, and, you know, in, in some states, they're still using coal. We, we need to get better at this overall. And I think California is positioned to take a leadership role just because that's what it does. Um, you know, if you think about the adoption of EVs in a fairly short period of time over the last five to 10 years, it's been impressive. It certainly hasn't gotten close to, you know, anywhere near 100%, obviously. But we've proven that we can make, sell, um, and charge cars on a certain level. Um, and then everything just has to be expanded. And that's the challenge, I think. It's supply chain issues, it's charging issues, it's access issues, and even pricing issues. Because still, for most people, a lot of these EVs are out of reach. Well, I was talking to two battery experts, one marketing, one a design guy, real high-powered scientist. And they said two of the biggest problems are it's sort of like tech, but even worse, that to jump from a startup to scale is incredibly difficult in batteries. I mean, to make a gigafactory is really, really tough. And one reason is there are certain parts of the process you can't speed up or make more efficient, like the, like the furnaces at the end that bake on the goop that's on the substrate. You got to add like 10 feet for every megawatt on a battery. So that those ovens are just going to head to the horizon with assembly lines racing through them. Because you can't you can't speed up the cooking because you end up with like a, a cake where it's dough in the center and, and burn on the outside. So there's some real limitations. There's not a lot of companies able to do this. So scaling is a big problem. The other one's fast charge. And I think I warned you, I was talking to the other guy and he said, you know, if you do a fast charge about 35 times, you've destroyed your batteries in your car. You've got to do it slower. And until they get the new technology for fast charge, we already know you need 13, 13 times as many fast charge, uh, charge stations in California as we have now. Is that the right number? Or is it 1300 times? Oh, I don't know. I mean, they, they, the 13 times sounds right. There are a lot of chargers 
for the number of cars out there now. But again, we're going to, you know, what 10 X the number of cars out there now or something like that uh, at some point, at least new cars. Yeah. And, um, and so, yeah, that changes the game, especially where access is, is, you know, not as easy as say, Oh, you own your own home. You can just put a 240 volt plug in there and call it good. You can charge whenever you want overnight. You're always good to go. Um, but that's not the case for so many people who live in, you know, multi-layered housing and apartments and all that stuff. And how do you get enough stations there uh, so that people can get to work and get to uh, their places each day? Well, even if they're in your homes, you know, I, a few months ago, I told you they dug up the entire street and just a couple blocks from me and they were putting down new lines. pg e was. And a buddy of mine went over and said, what are you doing? He says, we're we're, be boof we're boosting the, the amount of amperage running through this neighborhood. And he said, why do we need that? And he said, electric cars. So many people in my neighborhood have electric cars that they literally have to change the electrical grid for my neighborhood. So if that's true for all of California, as it apparently will be, there's another gigantic expense. And you said California is famous for, you know, introducing these things and being innovative. The companies are, the industries are, is the state government really known for that? I mean, we're burning down our forests because we didn't upgrade power lines in the Sierra, you know, since 1948. I mean, I, I, it's a wonderful idea. It's very appealing, but it just seems like a pipe dream right now. I mean, we'll see, you know, the, the idea that there are measurements along the way, I think is necessary because you're right. All these things are standing in the way, but what do we do? Do we say, Hey, let's just continue to put emissions into the air. I mean, we really don't want to do that. So whether this is a, um, Hey, let's see how far we can get or an absolute 100% goal. You know, I think we'll get to know in time, but it's <laughs> impressive. And it's, it's just something we have to do. We've got to get more you know, solar power going, we've got to get more renewable energy on the grid to more places, even within the state. And uh, if we can't do that, you're right, doesn't matter how many cars we have. But if we can, um, then it matters how many cleaner cars we have. And, you know, it's it's a goal to shoot for. Well, I've noticed we've come a long ways in just a few years, just right. using private industry and market demand. I mean, everybody, literally everybody's contemplating getting an EV. If just for driving around town, especially with high gas prices. I mean, it seems to me the market is making this happen pretty damn quickly. And whenever you try to get ahead of market forces, you tend to get in trouble, even though it gets politicians reelected. Right. I mean, there are obviously global concerns, not to mention a, a war that, that spikes the uh, you know price of oil. But are those global concerns going away? Are we going to have here in California, you know, dollar fifty, two dollar gas? in our lifetime, maybe not, like you know, maybe more. never again. Yeah. Um, and so the price pressure is going to be on to do this, not to mention, you know, the idea of fighting climate change and cleaning the environment. And, right. uh, you know, I think those are two things that are going to spur innovation, a drive for wealth. Uh, and, and that's what, you know, that's what California does it acts on those things. Yes, absolutely. I'm not sure Sacramento does, but around here we do. Right. right. Okay, let's talk about Twitter. Twitter had a very bad week. Uh, the Washington Post, of all places, just announced that uh, Twitter had labeled factual data about COVID as misinformation. This is kind of an argument against Twitter uh, censoring stuff that's loaded on his site. Uh, the Twitter must deal is getting even messier. I mean, is this story getting crazy or what? I mean, now we got a whistleblower. <laughs> saying that i guess he was uh we have whistleblower he's a, he was a former head of security is that what his job was well this guy ought to know right he hints that there's spies inside the company who are the spies where are they where are they from china uh, you know i mean are they domestic spies are they business spies i mean no there were i've said to be more encompassing term yeah i mean right it was a bad week for twitter uh, and, you know, it's, it's interesting, the spying thing, does that affect the deal? Who knows? The whistleblower, certainly that's going to be brought up in court. Even in the last couple of days, Elon Musk has now said, hey, he wants to subpoena Jack Dorsey, of all people, who was for the deal of Musk yeah. kicking things over. And now he's part of the deal of Musk trying to back out. So well, and one more. 
a uh, the judge on the case said that Elon Musk's uh, demands for uh, Twitter data was quote absurdly broad. So that narrows it down. Now that that will have a material effect on the case, right? And that was what I think stymied Musk for a while. Is all of his claims. And nothing really stuck as far as, oh, there are this many bots and this many fake accounts, et cetera. And Twitter said, hey, we told you this early on. The time for due diligence has come and gone. Now's the time to pay up and buy the company. Right. And they're going to court. And that was an interesting thing when, you know, the uh, the term you just used as far as, oh, no, that's, you know, that's not going to stick. That's absurd. He wants that. Because I think that's the court saying what Twitter's board said, which was, hey, the time for that has come and gone. Now it's time to figure out if this contract is binding. If it is, you've got to come up with tens of billions of dollars. But at the same time, you know, the prices of these stocks have moved with the deal. Um, even without today, uh, Twitter down about 10% this week. That's yeah, really they, they and I, I think, Right. And this is a stock price now that's pretty much 100% driven by whether or not Musk has to pay 54.20 a share. Um, and it went from about 44 earlier in the week. Now it's down to 40 a share. Um, you know, Tesla got a bump. You know, it, it had a Big good bump. week. Right. Um, and I, I think it's at this point, there's just so much, <laughs> there's so much flying around. I almost just want to say, and I can't believe I'm saying this out loud, but let's just get to court, litigate this and figure out which which side wins. Yeah, let's get this done. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay, uh, now we have a we have a request from our uh, our resident uh, uh, millennial, Jordan, and uh, you know I mean everybody's thinking about this because it's so much in the news. But the the idea of uh, dismissing uh, student loan debt, see you know to us is an intellectual concept, but, but for people like Jordan, it's a very real thing. And he asks. What kind of impact do you think that if that actually goes through? I, it's being it, it might be unconstitutional. I'm not sure a president can order a tax. I think Congress has to. But if it does go through, what impact will it have on the young working population, professional people in Silicon Valley? Because you can be sure they have a lot of education, and as a result, they have a lot of student loans. Absolutely, and you know we've been doing this story and talking to young people, and that is one of the barriers to living here, to perhaps getting close to a down payment. You know, no matter what your salary is, because you have a good education, if you're still saddled with debt, it's not just the actual physical amount. That's gigantic. But it's also the psychological amount. Holy Toledo, I'm in such debt. Do I want to go and pile on even more debt by trying to, say, buy a house, you know, a place to live here? And it is both monetary and psychological. And I think, um, I don't know what ten thousand dollars mean is it enough is it too much but it's, say, you went to stanford and picked up a phd double e or you 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 went to law school at berkeley right you know 10 grand is probably how much you spent on coffee to get through those years well i mean right does Let's... that really have an impact and to have a real impact you'd have to write off a hundred thousand dollars well, and I think maybe this is um, a trial balloon, because if you think about it, we'll be able to do the math at some point down the road and say, hey, eliminating this much student debt stimulated the economy, especially by those young people. And it's not just young people. I know people in their 40s and 50s still paying off student loans, but you know, stimulated the economy uh, by this amount. Um, and if we can say you know, X equals Y, ah, what about 10x or 100x you know or yeah, i mean there's this the latest estimates are 800 to a trillion 800 million billion to a trillion dollars i mean you start talking t's on numbers we're getting to real numbers here yeah what and kind of, what kind of short-term inflationary effect does this have right it, it's an inflationary thing but it's also you know isn't it also a stimulus and we've seen that sometimes stimulus works to boost the economy at least in certain sectors and if you say, what does student loan, what does student loan debt prohibit young people or even middle-aged people from doing? Um, we may learn at least on a certain level what that answer is, and then say, um, I don't know if we'll, you know, like the callers are out there saying, hey, we should just eliminate student debt, period. And wow, wouldn't that be amazing for the economy? But there is something to that. If you 
were able to get out of college because maybe you went to an inexpensive college or had scholarships or had parental help and you didn't have debt. Um, that cleared the way for a lot of things, you know, a starting salary that didn't have to be so big, a move to a place that maybe cost a little more, all these things that people are holding back on because they are carrying, um, you know, enormous amounts of student debt. What I'd like to see is is some of this bounce back to the the colleges and universities. I mean, oh, no, that's we're going to get into that in a minute. Be, speaking to the college professor, this has been a shell game for years. Parents are willing to pay whatever it takes, you know, to, to pay the freight to get their 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 child into college. Colleges have been growing; their tuition levels have been growing faster than the rate of inflation in the economy. I mean, for most of my lifetime. And you know they they turn themselves into Club Med, offering all these amenities. And it's like, if you give the money back on student loans, universities are going and and parents of the next generation of kids going to college, they're still willing to pay. Universities are just going to keep jacking these tuition rates up and up and up because they know they now have a federal guarantee of payment. Well, and that's the thing. So it becomes. A government, you know, and this is not the GI Bill sending people to college. This is the yeah. government saying, okay, we're going to forgive your yeah. debt, but the college is still getting World their money. War II, you know, did, did, now you're getting your drama degree and you, now you're asking for a plumber to help you pay for it. And there's something, in, there's some inequity in that too. Maybe a lot of inequity in that as well. well. Right. And I think the inequity starts with what colleges are charging for education and they don't have to charge that much. I think we all know that. Well, you're going to be it right now. Yeah, I know. I know. I uh, right. <laughs> Someone going through this, but still, um, it's it seems that colleges are so well funded, and like you say, if they're club meds or whatever, um, that's where I'd like to see the bounce back to make this more equal uh, and more, um, you know. Uh, spread the wealth as far as everybody getting a chance to go to a good college, not because the government is going to back it, but because prices come down and become more affordable for more people. That's what I'd like to see. Exactly. Okay. <clears throat> There's a new ransomware out there called Zeppelin, which kind of fits with those hydrogen gas stations I have in my neighborhood. Uh, they're targeting businesses by going through home employees. I mean, the the creativity of these criminals is just, you know, usually criminals, my father was in criminal investigation uh, and he, he was a spy, then he was in that. And he always said, the reason our, our, our society doesn't just completely collapse is because most criminals are stupid. We don't even know about the really smart criminals, but in the world of ransomware and hackers and all that, all of the criminals are really, really, really smart. And to, to have literally taken the homework revolution that was kicked into high gear by COVID and turn it into another backdoor into ransomware on, on corporations is astounding. I mean, I wish we could harness that innovation for like curing cancer, you know. Of course, of course. Thousand mile uh, duration on uh, EVs. I mean, there's a lot of things we could do with that kind of mind. Right. But what we need to do now, if, if you're out there and you're working from home is, or a company that allows people to do that is really tighten up the security. I think people got a little lax. That's what the, the, you know, the hackers and the thieves are thinking right now. And they're saying, ah, if I can get through, uh, you know, you at home on your laptop, uh, it's going to be easier because maybe you're on the home Wi-Fi instead of the Ethernet in the office. Maybe you're just a little lax with your security. And um, this interestingly comes at a lot at a time when a lot of companies are really trying to crack down on your productivity at home by watching you and tracking you and all these really spooky, creepy things. But it's also kind of spooky and creepy that uh, that now we're seeing these these malware types coming in and getting into the main network through the laptop or phone that you're using at home. And so it's just a uh, a big warning to, as we continue to make this sort of a hybrid economy, um, be extra careful at home. Right. And we, we, we make this mistake every single time. We introduce a new, you know, cultural structure and we don't make it secure. Right. Right. You know, I remember eBay, they trusted the users to take care of, you know, bad actors 
And within six months, they were just hammered by hackers and scum and scam artists and con men and everything else all over the place. They had to bring in a, I think it was a retired FBI guy to try to fix the thing. And we're doing it right now with this. Every everybody working at home today, everybody at Starbucks, you know, they're basically a porter, portal into their employer's servers. Right. So crackdown uh, companies out there, I I'm glad some people are allowed to work from home. That's terrific. But yeah, crack down on the security. It's going to be worth it for you in the short and long term. It'll save you some money. And connected to that, security stocks got real hot the last week. Palo Alto Networks apparently killed, right? And they've just incredible numbers on for the quarter. And they announced a three for one stock split. Yeah, security is is hot. It always seems to be yeah. a strong business because like you just said, they're always going to be, you know, people trying to break in and bad actors and that sort of thing. Um, but I wonder if well, they're, they're, aren't... They're warm. sometimes they're hot. Sometimes they're warm. Sometimes they're hot. Now they're in fuego. I mean, <laughs> they never, they never cool down. They're just different degrees of hot. And I think they're real hot right now. Right. And I think as you look forward to this sort of hybrid thing and how everyone's going to want to break in because of it, uh, I think companies are going to have to up their security purchases. And that's why these companies are doing so well. Yeah. Uh, okay, uh, Grove dropped me a note. It, he said, in case nobody's noticed, uh, Intel stock fell briefly to its lowest stock price in five years. Is this a good time? Uh, I, I hate talking investment, but is this a good time to get into Intel? I mean, do you have good vibes about where things are going? They're going to open up their Midwest plant, or at least cut the ribbon any time now, right? Is, is Intel in a on the brink of a growth mode, or is this a sign that a great company is now about to fade? Well, right. I mean, they've struggled with relevance for a long time. I mean, their market value is lower than AMD to this yeah. day. It's a fraction of what NVIDIA's is. You know, Qualcomm has eaten its lunch and mobile. So it's not so much that chips are struggling. I think this is actually going to be sort of a wake-up call for chips because not just the chip act, but the idea that we've got to fight this um, shortage of chips. And so we're going to see the equipment companies and the chip companies get uh, money and attention. And that's probably going to boost their bottom lines. Um, but, you know, Intel is that conversation maybe a decade ago would have said, ah, and therefore Intel dot, dot, dot. But it's not. Um, I think it's they're going great. to be they're going to get some of that boost because the chip industry is going to get that boost. And they're still a gigantic chip maker. Um, but how long has it been really since Intel has been at the forefront of anything, really? I mean, whether it's mobile devices that went to Qualcomm, um, cars, uh, you know, even even the Bitcoin mining that all went to NVIDIA, you know, AMD with with Lisa Su doing a fantastic job of, of coming back and getting stronger. And Intel has still this giant ship out there trying to turn uh, with wherever the latest industry is. And it's just big and slow and, and really struggling, I think, with relevance. Yeah, I mean, they need they need an Andy Grove again, you know, to really whip on things and get things turned, but nobody's there for that. Uh, I'm also struck that all the other chip companies are doing well right now. Chip equipment companies like Applied Materials are doing well. And this may be the first time I've ever seen where Intel went the opposite direction to Applied Materials. I mean, remember, they used to be across the street from each other on Bowers there. They were linked together. You know, their destinies were the same. And now they're not. Now they seem Intel's destiny was also linked with Microsoft. You know, you had the Wintel yeah. thing, whatever. And, and now it's not. I mean, companies like Apple and, and others are saying, hey, we'll put our own chips inside. Right. Um, and that hurt the, the Intel dominance. So, uh, you know, th they're still big. They're still a major force in Silicon Valley, but um, they haven't led in a while. Um, and and I, I don't know if that's leadership or just that other companies have sort of jumped in. I mean, Intel really missed the mobile jump. Completely. All and the way back still to the Still paying that price, yeah. Yeah. Okay, finally, uh, the James Webb Space Telescope. More photos came out this week. It was Jupiter this time astounding photos what do you think astounding is the right word i can't get enough of this stuff it is just incredible it's beautiful it's humbling um i'm amazed and it, and it i know that the web program took a long time to get there 
but we launched it. And within weeks, we've been seeing these incredible images. I, I just, I, you know, people will argue we should be spending money on other things. I get it. But there's something optimistic about, I don't know, humanity that we can look this far into really we'll say the future, but it's the past also that we're looking back at. And it's just incredible to see these images. I, I can't get enough of them. And I think we need them. I mean, tough times, sometimes science or entertainment like Hollywood did in the thirties will come through and give us something good and positive and uplifting. And they, they're, they're, contracyclical to all the downturns and, and difficulties going on around them. And I think right now, uh, the telescope, the web telescope has really given us something historic. And I agree. You know, next, you know what's next is they're talking about, we need a telescope on the far side of the moon because on the back side of the moon, uh, there's no sun. There's, there's nothing interfering a complete view of space. And they say, if you put the web telescope even on the ground, on the back of the moon, we'll see farther than we can imagine. Maybe we'll get an observatory on the dark side of the moon. Wouldn't that be cool? Yeah. And, and one of the great things, just not to belabor it too much, but one of the great things about Webb and whether it's looking past is really it's having a lot of young people looking forward, thinking what a cool idea it would be to work in space, in science, in STEM. Um, and and that's wonderful. And, and if I were, um, you know, younger, if I were in high school right now or something, I'd be thinking, wow, I want to be part of that. Uh, what an amazing thing that is. And I think that's terrific. You know, we look at the Empire State Building and Hoover Dam, and we go, why can't we do stuff like, big stuff like that anymore? But we are exploration from the Mars rover. I really think the Mars rover started to turn everything around that we're, we're creating really good quality, big stuff. And, you know, it, that's nice to see that Americans can still do that. I agree. Okay. Um, final announcement. We'll, we won't be here next week. Uh, we have a proud father delivering his daughter back to the East Coast to school. And uh, we'll see you in a couple of weeks. And that's it for now. You can find us on the Silicon Valley Business Journal homepage, as well as on Spotify, Anchor, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, LinkedIn, and, of course, YouTube. Have a great weekend. Scott, have a great trip. Thank you. And uh, we'll see you all in two weeks. Bye-bye.